Hello. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Professor Andrew Blythe, and I'm head of the Information Security Research Group at the University of South Wales. Um, back in 1990, when the Computer Misuse Act was first enacted, before that, the way we prosecuted hackers was for theft of electricity, believe it or not. Um, there was no legislation under which hacking was a criminal offence. The first guy that was prosecuted, a.k.a. the mad hacker, his defence went along the lines of he was addicted to hacking. So he woke up in the morning and he wrote a little programme for himself and he executed a little programme and he went to bed and he woke up in the morning and he executed a little programme and it worked, he got off. Uh, the law has developed since then um, that now we're looking at if you do get caught in the UK, we're talking between 5 and 10, 20 years in prison. We have the Data Protection Act. We have the new Data Protection Act coming in that's going to be really interesting the end of this year. Because under the new Data Protection Act, you are legally obliged to report a data breach. So those figures that Jason gave earlier on were companies choosing to stand up and say, we've been done over. We've lost a bit of data. So companies like Sony, Microsoft, and things like that, they choose to stand up and say, we've been done over. Companies in the UK and across Europe from the end of this year, will, when, whenever personal data is breached, lost, they will be required to report it to the Information Commissioner's Office. So for the first time ever, come the end of this year and the following year, we're going to start to get realistic figures about how much data is being lost and the way it's being lost. And now, when we talk about a data breach, that can be a 15-year-old kid in his bedroom breaking into someone's computer. It can be somebody losing their mobile phone that has personal data on it. It can be somebody leaving their laptop in a wine bar or in a taxi and just simply forgetting about it or leaving it on a train. But it's loss of personal data. And part of the problem that we have is that it's fairly easy and hard at the same time to recover data. And that's what I'm going to talk about, are the various challenges that we have in terms of recovering data. So a lot of companies have moved away from backing up data onto tape into backing up data to CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray technology. Why? Because these devices are impervious to a lot of the damage that a tape suffers from. So, if you take a tape and you put it on top of a speaker, bad things happen to the tape over time. Why? Because the speaker generates a magnetic field, the tape fundamentally is a magnetic field, and it's going to corrupt the tape. You take a CD, DVD, or Blu-ray, put it on top of the speaker, and effectively, it's going to have no effect. The problem that we have is that all I have to do is take that CD, break it in half, and effectively, I am unable to recover data from it. Why? Because I've broken the spiral. It's a relatively... It's not a, a, it's a recovery of this. is not a scientific challenge, it's an engineering challenge um, in terms of imaging, the, imaging, and, imaging and rebuilding it. And over the next 10 years, we will undoubtedly see forensic technology being developed that will allow us to recover CDs and DVDs. Oops, next one. Um, cyber forensics, computer forensics, we can have an interesting religious philosophical debate about the difference between the two. Um, one of the problems that we have at the moment in the forensic world is to do with big data. So I can go out and I can buy a six terabyte hard drive. And I can plug that into my computer. I can install Windows on it. Right? I can use it. 
And the police come knocking on the door and they arrest somebody. And the police have got 24 hours to charge somebody. And I get a piece of evidence in, this six terabyte drive. I have to image it. I have to analyze it in under 24 hours. And actually, that's a real challenge for us at the moment because the bandwidth we're talking about for six terabytes means basically it will take me of the order of 24 hours simply to image that amount of data. The other problem that we have is if you take the 7-7 bombers, for example, they had a couple of hundred forensic artifacts on them. So we have computers, we have laptops, we have CDs and DVDs. We have phones, we have tablets, we have USB sticks, we have USB jewelry, we have USB watches, right? All of those things need to be caught, captured, imaged. Uh, your, your car, right? Most modern cars, criminals like to drive high-end cars, right? They have sat-nav systems built in. They have engine management systems built in that track where they're going. They have tom-toms. Your phone. Most modern smartphones, you can track where you've been on a smartphone through location services. There is a vast amount of data out there that is available to law enforcement and the investigator, all of which has to be acquired and analyzed in order to derive a solution. We have this big data problem. And as if six, ten, as if six terabytes wasn't enough, we're starting to see helium drives coming onto the market. Now, a helium drive, we're talking about data storage of the order of 20, 30, or 40 terabytes worth of data. Just think how long that's going to take to image when you say, OK, I know your kids can finally have sufficient data storage to store all their pirate movies and DVDs and MP3s and everything like that that they do, right? And you know, you'll, you'll finally have peace at home because your kids won't be nagging you about, you know, there isn't enough storage on the computer for all of their music. How do we image that? Backing up to the cloud, right? How many people here on their phones or computers back things up to the cloud? Bad. Got to be honest, right? Bad, okay? Do you know where that data is stored? No. Uh, do you know who has access to that data? No. Um, from a forensic point of view, getting data off the cloud is a bit of a nightmare. Um, the other problem you have is a recent case, which was actually going through at the moment, um, the US Justice Department served a warrant against Microsoft for access to email. And Microsoft turned around to the US Justice Department and said, uh, Dear US Justice Department, we'd love to comply. However, given that the mail servers are in Ireland, in Dublin, uh, we consider that to be outside of US jurisdiction. And therefore, what you need to do is go to the Irish courts and get a warrant under the Irish courts. And we'll be happy to divulge that piece of information to you. The Justice Department turned around to Microsoft and said, our view of the world is you are a US company. Because you are a US company, those are US servers. They might be located in Dublin, but we view them as falling under our remit. Therefore, you will divulge that information to us. Microsoft, Facebook, and Google are united in opposing this, but the US Justice Department are taking it to the Supreme Court. If they win, what it effectively means is that any US company, wherever their servers are located in the world, the US government will have proved under US law that as far as they're concerned, those servers fall under US jurisdiction. So people that are saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide from the US. I'm going to go and have a, a, a mail account. I'm going to have it in Ireland. Forget that. If the Americans win. We have, so we have a problem with big data. There's issues about jurisdiction, about where it is. Um, you also have issues about, under the Data Protection Act, companies are required to take all reasonable measures to ensure that data is protected. When we start looking at the cloud, 
The problem that we have is we don't necessarily know where that data is. And from a forensic point of view, it makes it a real nightmare for law enforcement and investigators that I turn up. I'm used to imaging things where I get your phone, I image your phone. I get a hard drive, I image a hard drive. How do I image the clouds? How do I get data off the cloud? How do I get data that you've deleted off the cloud when that could be located in multiple jurisdictions? We also have problems with encryption. So the latest version of solid state drives are implementing encryption at the microcontroller level. The other problem that we have is as a result of the Snowden, what I call the Snowden effect, Google and Apple have stood up and basically said, we are going to create unhackable phones. We're going to create phones whereby the only way you can access the phone is via the security code, the four digit pin or the passphrase on the front of the phone. This issue was taken so seriously that Deputy Director FBI wrote an open letter to Google and Microsoft saying, please don't do that because actually you will make it impossible for law enforcement to get data off mobile devices. See, criminals like taking pictures of themselves, right? This is me committing a crime. This is me standing on top of 25 tons of cocaine, right? This is me doing stuff, and that's on their mobile phone. And the police want access to that. Mobile phone forensics at the moment is basically done by hacking the phone. So, hands up those people here who've watched, who've watched um, CSI Cyber. Um, so, they use Cellbrite, which is the standard forensic tool we use for, for mobile phones. Cellbrite actually use software implants, hacks on the phone to get the data off the phone. So when we talk about securing the phone, actually what, what's going to happen out of that is it's going to become much harder for law enforcement to get data off phones when phones are seized. Yes, under the UK we have Ripper. Um, and I think it's section 41 of Ripper, if I remember correctly, um, says that you must divulge your keys when challenged or else be held in contempt of court and go to prison for five years. Right, so let's put this in context. I'm a terrorist or a paedophile and I'm looking at spending the rest of my life in prison if I divulge details on my phone or I fail to divulge details on my phone and I go to prison for five years. Which do you choose? It's a bit of a no-brainer you choose the five years. Games consoles. Those of us that have kids, right? I have three kids, a 17-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a five-year-old. Uh, my 17-year-old's doing her A-level um, history paper today. Positive thoughts. <laughs> positive thoughts all day, positive thoughts. Right? She gets to go to university. Yes! Finally rid of it. Oh, sorry, I didn't say that. Strike that from the record. Um, my five-year-old plays computer games on an iPad. Um, his current favorite is Transformers. Um, my 14-year-old, um, after becoming a guru in Minecraft and running his own Minecraft servers, um, went on to play World of Warcraft, um, Team Fortress 2, the list goes on and on. He seems to spend his life permanently glued to either a games console playing games, a computer playing games, or a mobile phone playing games. Um, the problem that we have with game consoles is that they are connected to the internet because people want to play against each other. Online gaming is the thing. Right? When you play World of Warcraft or you play Minecraft, you're not playing against the computer, you're playing with other people. So these things are connected to the internet. They have browsers, they have storage. Um, if you take the Xbox, that has a hard drive. Um, Microsoft, bless their little cotton socks, when they created the X drive, did a bastardized version of NT for the Xbox that forensically makes it a nightmare. Um, I have students spending their time in research labs playing around with the Xbox, which is great, because when you show people around, um, that you have to put data on the Xbox, so the way you put data on the Xbox is you play games. 
So if you come down to my forensic lab, you will normally find a bunch of students playing either Call of Duty or Guitar Hero um, in front of the Xbox, um, and they call this research, which they think is great. Um, but it's about putting data on a device to figure out what's going on. Microsoft haven't divulged um, the structure of NT, the NTFS file system for the Xbox, so actually people like us haven't spent time reverse engineering it. Um, but we've got the Wii. Um, we've got the Sony PlayStation. The plethora is out there. They're all connected. Some of them have hard drives. Some of them don't. Some of them are using USB technology, and those that are using the latest USB technology are using full encryption on the USB technology. So how do you get data off that? Is a real, real challenge that we are struggling to meet at the moment. Satellite navigation, my favorite. Um, this is great, right? Criminals love them, right? They, they had no idea about satellite navigation, um, about the fact that it tracks where you've been, right? It tracks the route you've taken. Um, most satellite navigation today is operating to what, is, what we call military grade which means is accurate to within about 10 centimeters. Um, what does that mean? What it means is that most crash investigations, investigation that goes on now, gone are the days of the guy turning up and measuring distances and looking for skid marks on the road and calculating how fast the car was going based upon the skid marks and trajectory and all of that stuff. No, now what they do is they turn up with a little device that they plug into the USB slot on your car management system and it tells them exactly how fast you were going, exactly where you were and what happened at the point of impact. Um, because it's all stored in the engine management system um, it's all stored in your satellite navigation in terms of, of where you are. So you can't say anymore, um, the tree ran out in front of me, my lord. Right? I was driving down the road doing 30 miles an hour when this tree just jumped out in front of me. There was nothing I could do. I had to swerve to avoid it and hit an oncoming car. Um, now your car management system and your um, sat navs are going to tell you exactly where you were and the time where you were there. Um, it's also true if you use things like Google Maps and stuff like that. Um, Google Maps on your mobile phone records stuff. Where's my next one? Your web browser. Um, if we go back to the early days of the internet and we talk about word, worms like Slammer and Code Red, they were all about remote buffer overflows on your system. So a way that I could execute code on your system via the fact that you had a simple network connection. Microsoft and a lot of other companies have done a lot of work in protecting systems from these types of attacks. Arguably, um, we wouldn't see the same level of impact with Code Red than we would um, when it came out now, even if the, the, there was the, the vulnerability was there, simply because of the protection mechanisms that Microsoft have built inside the operating system. What does this mean? This means the attack surface has moved. We've gone from looking at the operating system and the services that are running in the operating system to looking at the browser. Right. Um, how many people here have had emails from the Prince of Nigeria telling them that they are his long lost cousin? He died recently, leaving them 10 million pounds. And if they can just click on this link, right, you know, all their money will flow into their bank accounts. It's great when I get it right, because, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, Prince of Nigeria, doesn't work. Um, or, you, you know, you get emails offering Viagra, penis enlargements, breast enlargements. You know, all these things are available. All you've got to do is just click on the link, right? Or, oh, it was great. I had an email the other day telling me that I'd won the Spanish lottery, and I didn't even buy a ticket, which I thought was brilliant. All I had to do was just click on a link inside my browser, inside my mail server, and it would run a browser for me, and hey presto. Um, users have become the weakest link, all right? There is one downside about doing computer science. So when I went to university, I did computer science. There was one downside about doing computer science. You become technical support for your family. My mum is 76 years old, and she phones me. I've got an email telling me I've won the lottery. Yes. Did you buy a ticket? No. But I could have won, no, you haven't won the lottery. Just delete it. 
right? Or it's great, you get companies now that phone you and they say, um, we've been in touch with Microsoft, we understand there's a problem on your PC. Really? Blimey, that's news. Yeah, uh, we understand you're running Microsoft. That really is news. Why is that? Because I've got a Mac. Beep. Right, social engineering. Um, you know, humans are, we the soft squishy bits, we are the weakest links. And your web browser has become the front line, as has your, as has your mail client, because now most email is rendered in HTML. The other problem that we have is Google, thanks to um, their security guys, implemented a, a feature inside the Google browser called private browsing. What does that do? What it does is it encrypts all HTML on the drive. And when you finish your browser session, that encryption key is thrown away. What that means is from a forensic point of view, if I come along and I try and recover HTML, all I'm recovering is encrypted files. If I go to the user and I say, can I please have the key to decrypt it? There are, they, will, they will say, I haven't got the keys, I'm using Google Chrome. Google Chrome generates the keys for me that allows me to browse when I'm browsing, and when I turn my browser off, those keys are thrown away. And it's called private browsing. Now, to be fair to Google, Google did it as a way of trying to mitigate a threat inside the browser of people coming in, exploiting your browser, and using your browser's function to look at old HTML, right? Because how many people here do online banking? I've got to be honest, I've never been able to bring myself around to do it. Online shopping, yeah, right? I, I, I buy things from Amazon. It's great, right? You know, Christmas comes around, I have to buy one person, one present, and that's my wife. Right, and I go online, and I go to Amazon, and I buy it, and Amazon delivers it, and it's brilliant. My wife buys Christmas presents for, any, for everything else. But online banking, all your bank details are there. It's stored inside HTML. Private browsing takes that, encrypts it, and hides it, which makes it impossible for someone when they're coming back to do it. The problem is it also makes it very hard when you're a criminal, right, for a forensic investigator to come along and recover it. There are applications out there that we all use today. So Skype, PGP, right? You know, I Skype my mother, right? You know, she still struggles. Click on the button. No, not that button. The other button. No, the one labeled video on. It's next to the button, next to the speaker. It's at the bottom of your screen, right? You know, she struggles, but she likes Skyping because she likes seeing the grandkids, right? Um, we do. The technologies come along, right? I use it for business. I use it for personal pleasure. Most people do. There are forensic tools out there that will, some work, some don't, shred things for you. So you can say, I'm going to run a forensic shredder. It's going to come away and do things for me. Um, I'm going to use full disk encryption at a software level and things like that. And all of these things erase data or hide data or encrypt data in some form or another. A company called um, Blackphone have just created a Blackphone, which they stand up and they basically say, this is a 100% secure phone, right? It will only talk to other Blackphones. Every traffic, every, old, every packet coming out of it is encrypted using AES 256-bit encryption, right? Which to all intents and purposes is uncrackable. Although it's interesting when you talk to the guys on customs and excise, they said, we don't have a problem cracking encryption. What we do is we walk the guy into a small room. At the end of that room, there is a table. On the table, there is a big tub of KY jelly and two long rubber gloves. And they say to the person, I believe you have secreted on your body somewhere pass keys, and I'm now going to perform a full body cavity search unless you tell me what the keys are. Social media, don't you love it? Facebook, MySpace, Google, right? You know, uh, my PhD students, uh, I want to know what's happening with my PhD students. Do I go and ask them? No, that would mean they have to talk to me. I would mean they, that would mean they have to engage in verbal communication. I go and look at their Facebook pages, um, or I go and find them on World of Warcraft um, and um, find out what they're doing. Um, but it's interesting 
that these have themselves become attack surfaces and a way for people to get hold of personal information. A valid online identity sells for about $50. Organized crime has moved into cyberspace. See, back in the 1990s, how many people here have watched a video called War Games? Matthew Broderick? Yes, the film that launched a thousand hackers. Don't you love it? Right? Brilliant. Right? 15-year-old kids. It informed a generation of what their view of a hacker was. Um, that view is somewhat different now. We have detailed supply networks built up where you can go online via the dark web. Sounds good and mysterious, doesn't it? The dark web. Right? You can go online and you can buy stuff. You can buy malicious software, you can buy zero days, you can buy worms, you can buy personal identities, you can buy credit cards. Organized crime has moved into this space and has created a whole supply infrastructure. And there are people out there that earn their living writing malicious pieces of code and selling it. You want to send spam emails, you rent time on a botnet. Right? We've, the criminals have monetarized botnets in terms of making, in terms of getting hold of. Um, if you want to rent it, you rent it. You rent time on it. You want to send spam emails, you can spend, send spam emails. You want to do a denial of service attack, you can do a denial of service attack. Right? Nothing's changed. Okay? Technology's changed, but the crimes haven't. I go to a company and I say, you give me £10,000, I'm going to mark you with a denial of service attack, and that's called extortion. Right? It hasn't, crime hasn't changed. Instead of going from throwing a brick through the window, I'm now going to hit you with a denial of service attack. But Facebook allows people to talk, social media, Twitter, and things like that allows us to share information. There was a little app, app written for the, for the iPhone many years ago called So Burgle Me. And what it did was it trawled Twitter to find out when people were away on holiday. It then geolocated that account to find out where somebody lived. It then overlaid it on a um, augmented virtual reality picture using Google Maps that you could basically see all the, fur, all, the air, all the houses highlighted in red where somebody was away on holiday so you knew to go and burgle them. The information's there. And of course, we have the dark web because it, si it sounds nice and scary. Um, all the dark web is, is effectively, it's a Tor network where you want anonymity as does the people that you're buying from. So you can go on to the dark web and you can buy drugs. You don't need to go down to the docks anymore or, you know, have those shady dealings in toilets, right? You know, where you go in and you give somebody 20 pounds and they give you some white powder. You can now buy it online. You want cannabis, you can buy it online. You want a gun, you can buy it online. You know, you want pharmaceutical grade whatever drugs, you can buy them online all through the dark web. All it is, is it's just a tour environment that allows people to access stuff and therefore to buy stuff. See, the problem that we have, there was a recent report done where they basically said, effectively, half of the world now has access to the internet. 2.4 billion people actively have an internet connection. There are, there is no planet, there is no country, no continent on the planet to which the internet does not reach, and that includes Antarctica. Wherever you are, effectively, the internet is there with you, either through fixed infrastructure, or I can take a satellite phone, I can take a laptop, and I've got connection to the internet. I can proxy stuff around. I don't have to access a browser correctly. I can go via a VPN, I can go via a proxy, I can bounce things around to access websites, I can do that for the tour. All of it is available. It's a flat, ungoverned space. I always say to people, it took us 20 years to sort out the, the law of the sea it will take us at least 40 years to, talk, to sort out the law of the internet. Why? 
Because when I go to France, I have to pass through border controls. When I go to America, I have to fill in a bit of paper that they get to decide whether they want me to enter the America or not. When I send a packet to America, I don't. The packet just goes there. And so we have jurisdictional issues. We have things like, I have Dropbox, I have iCloud, I have a dupe, and things like that. Right? Where are these services located? In what country are they? Because if I'm going to go and get that data from your Google account, from your Dropbox, right, or from your Google Drive, I may actually have to get a warrant for that country. So if those servers are located in Ireland, I may have to go and get a warrant under Irish law in order to get that data. And bear in mind, the moment I arrest somebody, a clock starts ticking that says I've got 24 hours. So these are the challenges that we face from a forensic point of view. None of them are insurmountable, but the surface is changing. Actually, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see a move back into good old-fashioned surveillance. So I want to know somebody's phone for their tablet. I want to know somebody's PIN for their tablet or their phone. What do I do? I survey them first. I watch what they're doing. I look when they type on their phone to identify what those key things are. Questions? <laughs> That's one thing I've done. Just drive slowly. Did anyone know that the police investigators use a sat navigation system? Really? Who's been caught by them? No? Okay. So, Andrew, uh, if people are backing up into the cloud and there's many benefits to that, how would you suggest they secure their data? control the ownership of the data? Is there any particular way of doing that? So, you can, if you create an encrypted file system and the, cl and the cloud service that you're using supports an encrypted file system, effectively what you end up backing up is encrypted data. What about the key, though? The key, uh, the key is held on your laptop. Okay, so basically so you hold the key. You hold the key. But most places aren't. Most places the data is just there. Um, most people don't even think about it. Um, but it is an issue that we have in law enforcement, is that you know I can come along and I can grab your phone and I can grab stuff like that. But if you back stuff up to the cloud, Right? I can't just go and download that because if that computer is located in a, another country, then I need a warrant from that country. Okay, next question. You don't know, you need to find out. I mean, this is one of the issues that we're seeing is, the way the UK works is it, is it, is it works under case law. We haven't seen a case law where, where these principles have been tested yet. Right? At the moment, everything that they've been, there has been sufficient data on the devices to allow the law enforcement police to bring a prosecution. We've never had a case where actually the only data has been in the cloud environment and they've had to go and get the cloud environment. Right? You know, it's an interesting legal debate as to, at that point, where does the data sit or where am I accessing the data? Because if that server sits in, in, say, Ireland, I am accessing that data in Ireland. Am I legally authorised to do that? Yeah, I mean, I mean to, 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 some, to some extent, what the Americans are doing is just trying to flatten everything out, right, and effectively say to American companies like Google, Apple, you know, you're an American company, and as far as we're concerned, right, you know, it's a, you're subject to American law. The end. Well, you could take it once you're a UK citizen, which is a UK law. That's your data. 
Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, and, and the, I mean, a, a good example of, of some of the issues of this was um, in France, to buy Nazi memorabilia is a criminal offence. Okay, you can own it, but you can't buy it. They tried to do a guy under French law for buying Nazi memorabilia from Amazon in America. And the ruling in um, the court was that they were going to take the phone and throw it out the window, pro promptly followed. Um, the ruling under French law was effectively one of, um, because the server wasn't in, wasn't in France, right, didn't fall under French law. Because the, the international conventions have basically been, when I buy something from the internet, the laws that come into play are at the point of sale. So if I buy something in America, it's not UK law, it's American law. If somebody buys something from the UK, it's UK law. Right? And this is why we're struggling with these concepts of if I go and get that data, you could get into a situation where a court just basically says, well, you weren't warranted to go and get it. You didn't have a valid warrant. Therefore, the, the evidence is inadmissible. It w so UK evidence around, so the, the rules of evidence around the, the world work on the principle of the fruit of the poison tree, which basically says the moment a piece of evidence is contaminated, anything that flows from that is inadmissible. So we could be in a situation of saying, yes, there were 5,000 paedophile images on, on the cloud, but actually you got them illegally, therefore they're non-admissible. Was anything on that? Was anything else found? No. So we, we have this problem, right? And, and it, you know, it comes down to international treaties, international conventions, and things like that. And you're right. I mean, you can say that you know, and what America are trying to do is they're just, from, where, from their law enforcement, they're just trying to flatten everything. Yes. But is the data, uh, is, is the data breach, if a data breach is reported to the information commissioner, uh, is there therefore subject to freedom of information request, which could then be uh, represented by the media? Um, yes. Okay. But you have to, but it's pretty much true at the, well, so it's true at the moment that all um, data breaches, all information commissioner stuff um, has to be, is subject to FOI requests. The only caveats where you can get out of an FOI request are national security. And then you have to prove that the exemption applies. So under the Freedom of Information Act, the ruling is effectively, we will divulge that information unless you can prove to the contrary. So if there was uh, national security, then you could turn around, they would turn around to national security. Um, the other one that police have used from time to time is threat to life. Yep. So if there was a threat to life associated with disclosing a piece of information that would normally be available under the Freedom of Information Act, then a judge would rule that it would not be, dis not be disclosed. Um, but these decisions are made by judges. Okay, and one last question. If I'm a business in the audience today uh, and I was breached, is there anything I can do to make the forensics easier? Um, yes, and that is um, <laughs> practice beforehand. So when you design your system, so a good example of this, right? Um, I, I do some work for the government and um, I saw the technical design uh, about three year, four years ago for GovCloud. And I, asked, I was asked for, to review it as a reviewer, and I reviewed it. It's great, it's lovely. Just one fundamental problem, right? What's that? Let's say you deploy this, and let's say I'm a police officer, and I turn up with a warrant to do a forensic investigation. Where am I going to plug in to get that data? Oh, well, we would just turn the police away. <laughs> now, let's get this right, sunshine. Police officer turns up with a lawful warrant and you're going to turn him away. I don't think so. Right? You know, you haven't thought about forensics. You haven't thought about where you're going to put the taps on your network or the taps in your cloud to allow people to recover data. Um, the biggest problem that we have is companies don't think about it. And then when it happens, I get phone calls of can we go in and do stuff? 
So, another good example. Um, a defense contractor that will remain nameless was done over by China, and we got involved, and we got asked, can we trace it? Could we actually say what was happening? And we couldn't, not to begin with. Um, and the reason why we couldn't is because they weren't doing any auditing. They weren't even doing simple auditing of when somebody logged on or logged off. They turned all, law, all auditing functions on every piece of kit they had off because it made their networks run faster, which made their users happier. So practice and forethought, I would say. Um, there is a thing that we call forensic readiness, and there are various documents and forensic readiness policies are starting to become more prevalent um, and it's something that, that companies need. You know, if, if you're going to be done over, and let's face it, you're going to be done over, right? You know, um, you need to get your head around this, what am I going to do? And normally when we get involved with companies, you say it will revolve around a decision where you have basically three outcomes. You turn around and you say, I don't care. You turn around and you say, well, I don't care, I want the system back up. Just get the system back up and running and fix it. I'm not bringing a criminal prosecution, is option one. Option two is, I want you to hunt these bastards down to the ends of the earth, right? Try them in a US court, send them to 20 years in a federal penitentiary where they're sharing a cell with a big black guy called Bubba that when you walk in there goes, your ma, puppy now, boy, right? Is option three. And option two is, I want to figure out what went wrong. I'm not bringing a prosecution, but I do want to understand the intelligence behind it so I can mitigate the threat in the future. Thank you. Thank you.